So I'm going to close now with showing what the math can do. All right. So here's our forward model. Okay. What we're going to do now is uh, take the dots and calculate what the diet input was. Okay. Using the model just described. Okay. So using the moving camera, this red is what we actually reconstruct from the white dots. Okay. So we actually reconstructed this square wave. It's very, you don't get square waves in output by accident. Okay. So this is a, this gives us confidence that this model is really helping us reconstruct. So rather than using the, you know, this diet that says, oh yeah, big change, gradual change back to initial conditions, we say, okay, no, it's a square wave is what happened. All right. Um, some other ways to sample things. This is some laser ablation methods that we're doing in the, the, one of the labs that you haven't been in yet. Um, and this is the same rabbit, uh, not same rabbit, but the, 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 the same wood rats that we did the breath experiments I previously described. Then we later were, got their teeth and were able to, so this is the breath that you already saw the data for. This is the enamel, you see, that uh, actually does not give exactly the same shape to the value. Very abrupt start, exponential uh, decay, and this is what the actually enamel looked like. So quite a different shape, uh, uh, different so on. So uh, for one example, this is a, a, a hippo that I was working on. What we knew is this animal died during a drought. And here's the delta C13. And we can see that, well, um, uh, it had something relatively constant diet, a gradual decline, and then almost a pure C3 diet. And something happened here at the end, and then it died. And here's the delta O18. So, something bad happened to this. this the water in this guy must have gone somehow bonkers. So the only good way to say it. Well, um, this is what the reconstructed diet and water of this individual is. And so what we see now, so the gray area is our best prediction of the actual diet at each of these times. And we see that instead of this gradual decline, we see there's a very abrupt decline in the diet. So it was essentially a pure, close to a pure C4 diet, switched to almost a pure C3 diet. Uh, and same thing here, a much more abrupt change in the water value that corresponds uh, very well with this other diet change. So uh, this is uh, uh, what it actually looks like. And so several of the important things is previously you might say, oh, this diet switches in here. But no, the diet switches at a very different place. And this, we've looked at some other individuals. So hypoplasia is a form of damage to your tooth that dentists like to use as a word. Uh, and what we were finding is that the isotope, that when you line up the reconstructed isotope data with hypoplasia, things make sense. But things often don't make sense because the shape of the curves is considerably changed and, and peaks can be shifted by, by quite a bit if you don't take into these sort of things into account. Okay, okay I'm gonna just zoom real quickly in a couple of minutes through uh, our work on human hair. I think Leslie Chesson will talk more about this in forensics, but this is, a, 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 this is what we see in human hair, okay, or other hair. This is a horse from Georgia it moved to Utah. You can see a fast change, slow change, and then we get to whatever the normal value is. So probably several components. This is hydrogen isotopes. Uh, some human hair from different places. Um, uh, this is Ulaanbaatar. This is Salt Lake City. I'm not sure why it's so light colored there. This is Beijing. Um, Nakuru, Kenya has sort of the highest delta 18 
and the highest delta D, and that's because the isotope value of rainwater there is uh, uh, very enriched, as you should know from day two lecture. So this is a student who grew up in Beijing, China, moved to Salt Lake City. She comes to Salt Lake City, and her carbon isotopes, she can still find the food that she likes. We have a lot of Chinese community here. Oxygen, though, she can't find Beijing drinking water. She has to drink Salt Lake water. And we see that in the hydrogen isotopes and the oxygen isotopes. Okay? So the oxygen, hydrogen isotopes are, you know, you, you, you don't bring your water supplies with you in, around the world. So a project that uh, Jim and I and Leslie Chesson and a bunch of others were involved with was, uh, uh, this is a tap water map, drinking water from around the United States. Okay? So delta 18 from minus 1 to minus 20 something. Okay? And, you know, this is basically very close to the meteoric water line, but a little bit different. And this is based on a thousand, more, more than a thousand different cities sent us water samples. Okay? So Jim and I recruited our relatives. Jim recruited his wife, and I recruited my kids. And we said, go take a trip. So my, child, my children's task was to drive to the border, take the first uh, rural road south and every day collect at least hair samples from at least two barber shops. Okay, because barber shops, we don't know who the individuals are, so it gets around the whole IRB issue of, you know, human sampling issues. Okay? Pardon? That's true? Yeah. Do you don't know anything about the individuals? Yeah, Jim? if you pick the hair off, off the floor, yeah. Yeah. it's going to call trash. Yes. Yeah, or if it's in the trash can. They're not going to sue me. This right. Is good. Yeah, so you can't, I mean, right, you can't ask that person over there. But yeah. So uh, Edna and a friend did this transect. And we selected these so that they'd maximize this isotope gradient, as you can, as you can see. OK? So I know my daughter said, you know, US is a really cool place. There's stuff you'd never expect to see. Uh, <laughs> You know, so she took and she said, and we had barrels of fun. See, um, so the local drinking water. So at every place, um, the, our, our collectors would get drinking water in here, and so we have paired northern Montana water here, paired central Texas water here. Samples. The scale is collapsed, but that doesn't matter. Uh, because we, we know the relationships between them. So the next thing we can do then is reconstruct a human hair project. Okay, so now instead of this map, we have our human hair maps, and we can use these um, to uh, perhaps reconstruct movement. So then this application is to one particular case, and this is a case that... Uh, Came, to, came originally to Jim, and the notion was, OK, here's an individual that has, had, this is what was found, hair, some bones and stuff, and so what can be done? So the hair was what we say bundled, because it's very difficult to get an analysis from a single hair. We need, to get all of our analyses, we needed um, like on a single hair, maybe a centimeter or more. But if we put a bunch of hairs together, we could get a finer scale time resolution. So these are inside of a glass tube. Okay, so they're all stuck together. And as you push them out of the end of the glass tube, you can cut off the ends. And so everything is lined up lengthwise. Okay. So the problem is that we've bundled the hair together. And what we know is that about 90% of the hair on your head is in the growth stage, and about 10% is in the resting stage. So when you comb your hair, the stuff that comes out is the resting stage stuff. And if you actually look at it under the microscope, you'll see that the bulb of the hair, and that hair kind of looks rather withered, or sometimes you don't even notice it at all. If you pull your, you yank your hair out, there's usually a nice little white bulb attached to it, and it looks very different than, okay, that's this stuff, okay? So this 
growth stage lasts for about five years. And this resting stage is about six months. So the hair in this that, that we were working with was a mixture of these two things. Okay? And the growth rate might be different. So we were able to do this really well with elephants. And we were able to actually get the exact growth rate for every single hair. What we found is that um, for elephants is that the growth rate is constant over time, but different hairs have slightly different growth rates, plus or minus about 10%. Okay. So now we're going to go back to our moving camera model. And this is Chris Ramin, who is a graduate student in mathematics, who one day wandered in and said, I want to work on isotopes. And I said, great, I love mathematicians because they can do things I can't do. So Chris's notion was, well, let's recast this in a different way. And this is, this is an output of something. Uh, and so he said, well, let's look at what is the age after 2.5 months, what does a distribution look like of age of hair? Okay, so we know that it's growing at one centimeter a year, plus or minus 10%. And we know that 90% are growing, are growing. And 10% are random old things of some age, but can't be older than 10 years. So they, they, the, the random age of all the hairs we might sample, they'll grow for six years and then, and, and then stop growing for six months and then they fall out. So you have nothing older than 6.5 months. But so this is the average age, he says. So at two and a half months, this is the age distribution. After five months, this is the age distribution. After 10 months, this is the age distribution. After 20 months, here's the age distribution. So these guys started out looking like that. So our signal is really messed up. And this is just some modeling examples that he showed. This is actually an elephant, the delta N15 of an elephant that went from Mount Kenya down to the desert, to Mount Kenya to the desert. And we actually only had two years, but we actually just repeated the data. And I said, he'll use that as a model input. The important thing is to say, what happens to this signal, which is quite regularly, if we attenuate it in the same way? And he samples it the same way we would sample human hair, <laughs> only every once in a while. So here's what happens to our signal. After 20 months, our really strong signal is highly attenuated. Here's another example. And this is actually an example of, this is a true uh, example from an elephant. Uh, and he said, let's uh, bundle it the way that human hair would grow. So this dark line is, if it was bundled the way that we sampled, this is what it would look like. And then he said, well, now let's undo the mathematics this is what we reconstruct. And you can see even this little tiny bump ends up constructing something pretty good. So, so we, we, we can do these things. This gave us some confidence. And so now this is the way we get back to this, this problem. So this was the initial results that we had for this unfortunate young woman. Um, we had interpreted it as region one Region green, region blue, region green, region sort of blue, region green. So green is in here. It includes Salt Lake City. So this is the hair map. And went north and back Salt Lake City. Up here, again north. So the notion was, well, maybe this person was maybe worked in Yellowstone Park in the summers. You know, so seasonal um, migrant. And, and we had no, we couldn't quite figure this out. Now there's two problems here, and actually some other interesting things. This is a gradual change, as if the person took a while to get in between places, okay? And the other problem is that if the person is moving, then we're comparing her to an equilibrium map. Okay, but she's, maybe she's never at equilibrium, so that, 
is another thing to think about. So this is where Chris was so important in this particular study. So Chris is the one who did this mathematics. He said, okay, let's take this signal and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to invert the signal and then I'm also going to correct for the turnover time of body water. Right? And so that's what he does. This is the inversion and then corrects for body water. Now we actually see abrupt changes. Okay, so those gradual changes are now abrupt as if it, she could have gotten in a car and done it in one day instead of taking a month to get from Salt Lake to these other northern climbs. And now it's appropriate to correct it to the equilibrium map. And so when you do this, then Chris identified this new red region, okay, okay which is related to that little hump, which is basically related to those two points, okay? So it's, they, don't, they don't look important, but those two points create that hump, and then that hump is enhanced here. And so then the police say, well, wait a minute, now we also need to look at the corridor from Seattle to Portland, Oregon, at least. There's lots of police departments there we can call up. And again, I started my talk with something wonderful, you know, getting a New Yorker cartoon. The week that Chris defended his PhD thesis, his information helped solve this, um, who the individual was. So this is a newspaper headline from the same week that Chris was defending his um, PhD thesis. Okay? So um, with that, um, I only took uh, half of, uh, half of, half of, you know, an extra 15 minutes of your time. Um, so um, that's all I have to say. In this part of the lecture, I'm happy to answer questions, but I think to keep things on time, maybe you can ask them individually later, unless somebody has one burning question. <laughs>